Well, hello there and good morning. On this week's Center of It All, we dive into the pool season, get the do's and the don'ts for your turf, and Mel cooks up a delicious shrimp dish on Kitchen Encounters. These and so much more coming up next on the Center of It All. Welcome to the center of it all. Thank you so much for joining. I'm your host, Alex Rabb. Tis the season for water fights, tummy flops, and diving contests. You guessed it, it's pool season. I met up with Clearwater Pools. They showed me how to properly open up the pool for the summer. So it's time to open up the pool, clean it, and enjoy. Clearwater Pools out of Center Hall recommends opening up your pool as early as possible, even as early as April. But why? The pool will open cleaner the earlier you open. Uh, the shorter days doesn't allow the algae to grow and uh, you'll use less chemicals getting it cleaned up and, and less work and then that way when the weather does break you're ready to be swimming right away when everybody else is still uh, trying to get their pool open. So once it's open check that the equipment is together and that the filtration is pumping and circulating water. The skimmer grabs all the debris on the top of the water, pulls it in and collects it in a basket. Sometimes there'll be some debris that's been falling on the pool. This time it looks particularly clean, but either way, you simply dump that out. Now it's time to hook up the hose and start vacuuming the pool. Make sure to inspect your vacuum bristles to see that they're long enough so the vacuum doesn't damage your pool. Attach it to the back hose. Then grab the back pole and connect it to the vacuum. Place both in the water and... You want to make sure your back hose is full of water. And we're going to take that and we put it in the bottom of the skimmer. And then it's just a matter of simply running the back hose across the bottom of the pool. And I don't know if you can see it there. Picking up the debris. Tom suggests starting at the deep end and working to the shallow. It makes cleaning a lot easier on you. So what you're gonna do next is attach your algae brush to your pole. And you're gonna go through and just simply brush your walls and get everything nice and clean. Then you want to give the pool a final skim. After that, we head back to the equipment to check the filter and the pump for debris. So be sure to ask your local pool dealer about your specific type of filter and how exactly to clean and recharge it if that step is even necessary. The last step is maintaining the chemicals in your pool. Your pool needs these chemicals to one, keep the water balanced. You want to have a uh, pH of your water somewhere between a 7.2 to a 7.6. That makes the water very comfortable on your skin. Also, your eye has the same pH, so you want to make sure you keep everything nice and balanced. And you also want to keep your sanitizer levels uh, at their proper level as well. So use a test strip to check all levels properly for comfort and safety. If you're confused, no worries, there's help. If you go to your local pool store, uh, he's going to have a computerized testing lab. And you can bring a water sample, and in the case, if you bring it to Clearwater Swimming Pools, we'll test your water for free. We'll run it through our lab. We'll tell you where all your uh, levels are and let you know what you need to add to the pool. But once again, it's important. You want to make sure, especially when the weather's like this, hot day, and hopefully a long, hot summer, you want to make sure that water stays crystal clear so you have weeks of enjoyment throughout the year. Follow that advice, and in no time at all, you'll be lounging in your pool catching all of those rays. Stick around. We have to take a short break, but when we return, we go from surf to turf. Hello, and thanks for watching. The hot summer sun will soon be taking a toll on your lawn. Andrew Callista went out to get a few pointers on how to have a beautiful lawn all summer long. After a nice central Pennsylvania spring, your lawn should be coming in great. And with the warmer nights ahead, that grass is really going to begin to sprout. So I was wondering how to keep your lawn beautiful for the scorching summer months that lie ahead here in central Pennsylvania. I headed out around the area and found Green Thumb Landscaping. I spoke with Kepi Arnoldson and she told me about some of the techniques the pros use in lawn care. One thing she promotes is longer cuts and using your clippings as food for your lawn. So the one thing you want to do is um, you want to let your lawn get a little bit longer in between your mowings. It's better for the health of the grass, for the lawn overall, 
and we try not to over fertilize. So in, um, you want to do maybe a, a weed and feed in the spring and then late in the fall, maybe one more in the summer. They say three is good. But um, if your lawn is very healthy and you let your clipping set, so if you have a mower that has mulching blades on it, it's better to let the clippings as long as they don't pile up too much and the lawn doesn't look bad. If you mow it where you're only cutting off a small amount each time and you let it stay a little bit longer, that'll go down in between all the uh, lawn blades and it'll actually make your lawn healthier. Longer length promotes summer growth. It also prevents burning, so you only want to cut off about a quarter of the grass blade. It's also important to have sharp blades on the mower so not to shred the grass and prevent diseases. Now in Pennsylvania, cool season grasses are very popular. These will turn brown come summer, but don't panic, says Kepi. Yeah, so that's okay, deep, long waterings. Um, so don't, don't water frequently. If you're gonna water your lawn, water it, saturate pretty good if it's not gonna rain, and then let it go for 10 days, you know, two weeks. If your lawn is your pride and joy, but life throws you a curveball, lawn care professionals are here to help and make sure your homestead stays as healthy as possible. The services that they provide include things like um, grub control, weed and feeds, edging, mowing the lawn each week. These are things that the homeowner doesn't have to worry about. But Kepi also says you could have a great lawn on your own, even if time and money are factors, just by using one simple tip. In these days and times where our time is very important, for others where times are hard because there's, the money flow is tight these days, just get some sharp blades on your mower and leave it go a little longer. You'll cut down on the amount of time you have to do your maintenance or call in somebody for help once in a while to get a break. There are many landscape firms that'll come in and just do an occasional mowing for you. So now you know. Let it grow, cut it high, leave the clippings, and water smart. Just about an inch every eight days. One last suggestion Kepi had was evaluating your lawn and knowing how and where you use it. My other suggestion is to cut down the expansive lawn that you have unless you're really using it, that we can be more conscientious about water use, about our time, because you have to maintain that lawn, you know, and so maybe um, make some less, more hardscape areas or some flower beds or something that takes up a little bit less time and it takes up some of the space. So in areas that you really use the lawn, focus your lawn there, and areas that you don't, phase it into something else where it's not such a high maintenance um, chore for the homeowner. So if you find yourself staring into your neighbor's lawn and thinking, man, I wish I could have a lawn like that, you can if you follow just those basic tips and give your lawn some tender loving care. For the center of it all, I'm Andrew Callista. Thanks, Andrew. If that piqued your interest, just wait. This is the first of many how-to segments dealing with your lawn and home. Now we have to get to another summertime favorite, the grill. Now that the warmer weather is here, it's time to get out the grill. But if it's been a few months since you've used it, there are a few things you may want to double check before lighting it up. Dr. Tom Tallman is an emergency room physician at Cleveland Clinic. He says the first thing you want to do is to check the gas line for leaks. Safe ways to check to see if there's a leak in that coupling, like putting, putting water or soapy water over it, because that's an issue. That means you've got a, you've got a problem you definitely want to fix before you try to light it. Tighten all of your connections before turning on the gas. You may hear a leak or even smell it, but your best bet to find it is by covering the line in soapy water. If there is a leak, you should turn to a professional to fix it. Position the grill in an open spot on your deck or patio. Make sure it's not under an awning or overhanging branches. And Dr. Tallman says you should also remove the grease and fat buildup in trays below the grill so it isn't ignited by a hot grill. If you've left you know, any of the grease or old stuff on your grids over the winter, it's probably going to be moldy and dirty when you open this back up. So that all needs to be scrubbed down really good. You can even pull out the grates and scrape the inside of the grill, then vacuum the debris that's left behind. Cheers to a happy and safe growing season. We have to take another break, but I hope you're hungry. Mel is cooking up a light shrimp and pasta dish. Mmm. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the center of it all. I'm your host, Alex Rabb. I hope you brought your appetite. On this latest Kitchen Encounters, Mel Prosciutti cooks up a true Greek style shrimp pasta salad. Mm -mm. The sun's come out and the temperatures have soared. If you're like me, you can't wait to get outside to entertain. This morning, I scrolled through my recipes and came away with my favorite main dish, one dish meal. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a Greek-style shrimp pasta salad with some lemony garlic dressing. 
This one not only beats the heat, it stands up to it. Let's get started. I'm making the lemony garlic dressing first because this has to refrigerate for a couple of hours to let all of the great flavors marry together. In this measuring container, I've put a cup of red wine vinegar and I'm going to add a quarter of a cup of vegetable oil and a quarter of a cup of lemon infused olive oil. Now, lemon and orange infused olive oils are inv available pretty much everywhere nowadays, but if you can't find this product, just add the juice of a half of a fresh lemon to this. Half a cup of granulated sugar. I'm just gonna whisk this briefly to let the sugar dissolve a bit. And we've got a good generous tablespoon of Dijon mustard, which is going to help emulsify this and keep it together when we shake it. And next, I'm adding minced garlic, three cloves, but they must be run through a press, a garlic press. Just put the clove in, squeeze it through, out it comes. Do not use garlic powder. There's really no substitute for this. For our seasonings, we've got a half a teaspoon of Greek seasoning blend, a half a teaspoon of coarsely ground black pepper, and a half teaspoon of sea salt. Give this another whisk. And last but not least, I'm gonna stir in a quarter cup of crumbled feta cheese. After all, this is Greek style, and feta and mint are classic in Greek cuisine. Just a quick stir. And what I like to do is transfer this to one of, transfer my salad dressing into one of these two cup measuring containers, which are inexpensive and you can find them in almost every grocery store. And put a nice little lid with a shaker top on it which is going to make it really easy for me to shake and pour this onto the finished pasta salad. Now what you have to remember about this dressing, this is a little food safety tip from me. Whenever you're adding fresh ingredients to salad dressing, whether it be herbs, garlic, onions, even ginger, and cheeses, you have to keep it stored in the refrigerator and the shelf life is really only three to four days because fresh ingredients will grow bacteria in a salad dressing and that can make you ill. When you're making pasta salad, the first thing you have to do is cook your pasta. You want it al dente, you want it well drained, cooled and dry. And I don't mean dried out, I mean moisture free. I've cooked one pound of a combination of tubes, spirals, and shells. I like these because the shape of them really hangs on to the dressing. I laid them out on a large baking pan on parchment paper for about 45 minutes to make sure that they were moisture free. And I'm just going to basically dump these into the bowl. I think we lost one or two, but that's no big deal. Pick these up. <laughs> and now we're going to add our shrimp. And I've cooked a two pound bag of shrimp, which is giving me about one pound of finished shrimp with the tails off. You've seen me do this on Kitchen Encounters at least one or two times before. I'm using medium shrimp today because I want a uh, bite sized shrimp in every bite of pasta salad. Next, we're adding about a cup of red onion. The dahlia onions are in season right now. Feel free to add those. A cup of black olives that have been sliced in half. And as you can see, this is all about getting our pieces all bite-sized and about the same size. And next, a cup and a half feta cheese because black olives and feta are, of course, very Greek. 
we're just gonna fold this, rough fold this all together. And now we're going to dress our pasta salad with the lemony garlic dressing. And the key to dressing the pasta salad is to do this slowly. You wanna drizzle it in. We've got two cups here, but we may not use all two cups. And you wanna stir and stir. And ideally, you wanna wait about a minute or two in between stirs before adding more dressing. I'm just gonna keep going. And usually by the time you get to about a cup and a half, your pasta and your ingredients will have absorbed an, as, about as much dressing as they can without the dressing puddling in the bottom of the bowl. If the dressing puddles, you've got too much dressing. You've overdressed your salad. Now we're just going to add a little bit of salt and pepper. The salt is gonna bring up the flavor of the sugar in the dressing. I'm going to toss this again, and I am going to taste this. Oh, that is just perfect. Mm. This is ready to be covered with plastic wrap and put in the refrigerator for three to four hours or overnight. Now, when it comes out of the refrigerator and just before serving, we're going to fold in our diced tomatoes and zest the finished dish with lemon. When properly prepared, pasta salad is awesome. When not properly prepared, pasta salad is awful. And over the years at outdoor picnics and barbecues, I've had my share of both. The biggest mistake people make is overdressing their pasta. Do not drench it in dressing, folks. After that, did you know there's an actual formula for making perfect pasta salad, and you can use whatever combination of ingredients you want. You have to remember three steps. First one, one pound of cooked pasta, drained, cooled, and well dried. Step two, one and a half to two and a half pounds of additional ingredients, with one pound of it being your protein, your chicken, your fish, or your cheese. Step three, one and a half to two cups of total salad dressing. Add the first cup first, add the second half cup judiciously, and add the last half cup only if you need it. For these and all of my recipes, just go to my website. Now remember, if you make it, tell us about it on our Facebook page. Hold that thought. We'll be right back. Thank you for joining the center of it all as we start to wrap things up. As we get into the summer months, there's a lot of amazing services in Pennsylvania held for those who served and who are still serving. These men and women deserve to be remembered. So John Stroh went over to the Military Museum in Bullsburg to see exactly how that's done. A wise man once said, those who cannot remember their history are condemned to repeat it. And it is with those words in mind that we should pause to remember America's military history and those who paid the ultimate price. And there's no better place to do just that than at World War II Revisited at the Pennsylvania Military Museum in Bullsburg this weekend. While the event won't place you on the beaches of Normandy, museum educator Joe Horvath says that it will give you a sense of what life was like in a military camp. The uh, reenactments and bivouacs and camps do allow is for you to experience somewhat vicariously the experiences of what it would be like in the field. The smell of canvas is not forgotten by many veterans. It just has a particular uh, odor about it. 
the reenactors themselves dressed in the period uniforms, you could see how they wear it. It essentially takes the collections inside a military museum and brings life to those collections. And one of the folks that helps to do that is Tyler Cristani of Pleasant Gap, who tells us a little more about what's inside each camp. Uh, they'll see the American encampment, they'll see the German encampment. Uh, Germans uh, usually turn out pretty good. They have some. They have some cool stuff. Some machine guns. Some uh, some submachine guns. Some rifles. I have a pretty good, extensive collection of rifles myself. Uh, they'll see tents. Everyone dressed up in period clothing, combat gear. Uh, we do the USO show with the Andrews sisters, so they'll get to see some entertainment side of World War II. Most of us have seen or at least heard of Civil War reenactments, but World War II reenactments are relatively new and Horvath talked about the event's birth 14 years ago. A void on that weekend, an opportunity of where people came back for Memorial Day that we could bring them into the museum and let them know what's going on here, also provide some really good education programming with the reenactors and the World War II reenactment. So that's how we chose to do it on Saturday and Sunday of Memorial Day weekend. Horvath hopes that events such as this will spur the public to learn more about our own history. My personal uh, hope is that we pique somebody's interest in reading about the history because if we don't understand where we came from, we're going to keep going in circles, doing the same things over and over. And I believe someone else said that that's sort of a mark of insanity. So we need to learn from our past. And hopefully the reenactments and museums will get people interested in cracking open the books and read what had happened before them. Because what's happened before them makes us who we are today and who we will be in the future. Thanks, John. Well, that's it. Now, before you go off to enjoy the rest of your day, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. See you soon. And I now leave you with the soothing sounds of the Nittany Nights. Whoa!